Welcome back to our Ukraine vlog. We are a communication team from the National Office of WAWM Norway. In the previous episode, we traveled to Ternopil, where we visited ministries, filmed for a documentary, and heard many impactful stories. And now, we are headed to Kiev for part two of our travel. We left Ternopil joining another team, also from Norway, that were heading to Kiev. Are you excited about the trip? Woo! So you yeah. can go over there. <laughs> Six hour ride and then we're there. Let's go. Let's go. This is Ryuna and Ruar. They have been traveling back and forth to Ukraine since the war started, giving humanitarian aid and helping people to cross the border. So there were stories about uh, survivors and, and lots of horrible stories as well. So. Yeah, I started to cry when I talked about this thing. Yeah. We, we called ourselves the weeping Vikings, me and my brother-in-law, because <laughs> we thought that maybe it kind of would be easier and easier not, not to cry, but it went it was the other way around. When the war broke out, the Ukrainian army destroyed most of the bridges that were leading into Kiev. And a small river outside of Kiev helped to protect the city from invasion. I think that this little river wow. was such a major importance. That was the river they couldn't cross. Yeah, exactly. That was the end of it. Even though the Russians weren't able to get into the city yet, they had been bombing and destroying a lot. As we were getting closer and closer to the city, we saw more and more destruction. But this was just a taste of what we were going to see during the next days. After a long day of travel, we finally arrived in Kiev. As we were going out to eat dinner, we met up with a couple of Ukrainian filmmakers that had been making a documentary from the front line. They shared their experiences and even showed a clip of a bomb going off just meters away from the where they were standing. They start by um, going to one of the house projects, so that will be good. We were on our way to visit and film the house building project called My Home Project. They build temporary houses for those who have lost their house as a result of the bombings. But before that, the other Norwegian team wanted to stop by a store to buy some radiators to help people get through the winter. Maybe something more than children. Just whatever. Balls or the balls. Candies or things. Yeah. Driving closer and closer to the village of Moschun, we were preparing ourselves for the destruction we were about to face. Shockingly, the first thing we saw was a doll hung up by its neck in the tree as a threat to the Russians. This graphic sight hit us with the seriousness of what they have gone through. A threat implying that they have had enough, that they won't accept another attack. This is Nina. She showed us her home completely in ruins. 
We could only see the burned remains of what used to be a house with walls, roof, and furniture. So what do we see around us here, Carolina? There's a bomb that uh, was hit, it was struck here. This is the house. Washing machine, one a second, gas stove. So it was basically, it was people's life, you know. Nina and her husband lived here for 14 years. Now their life laid in ruins. How is it seeing all this? <laughs> it's awful. And this is just one house. Like, I, I guess it's thousands of houses. Her story left a mark on us, and we got the permission to share her story in YWAM Norway's magazine. It's kind of hard to to understand that this is like going on right now. It seems like this could be something that's happened in the like Second World War. You know, you see the house destroyed, and this was just like half a year ago, and it's still going on in so many parts of the the country, like right now. And it's just it's just kind of uncomprehendable. Like you can't. Yeah. After a strong first impression, we continue to visit people that have lost their homes. The people here had suffered and lost a lot, but the temporary houses has given them a new hope. A hope of living through the winter, of staying in their own country, and that there is a future for them. If I have a life, I need to continue to live, was what Mikola said as he showed us his new home. Even though a house will help them, it might not be enough for the cold Ukrainian winters. So Duvar gave away radiators to each house we visited. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hanna. Hanna. Tanya. Though they have suffered, we were surprised by their smiles and hospitable spirit. Specifically by this group of women that invited us into their beautiful garden, right next to their destroyed homes. I want uh, fresh apple juice. Even though a lot had been taken away from them, they still gave of what they had. <laughs> it's good. <laughs> this beautiful garden, we almost forgot the ruins that were just in the corner of our eyes. It was a strange and surprising contrast between beauty and destruction. Runa noticed that our boy was playing with nails from the ruins of his own house, so we gave him a football. Thank you. He was already wearing football shoes and was now finally able to use them for its purpose.
Tanya and her family had to move into their garage after their house was destroyed. Garage, uh, my car, там была. Идем. How long have you been living in the garage? September. Okay. Yeah. So the, the whole summer they was preparing the garage so mm -hmm. they can move in for the winter time. Yeah. We continued to see a building that was bombed from an airplane. We could still see the cupboards and furniture from the people that used to live there and imagine what their life looked like before. After a morning full of strong impressions and meetings with people, we spent the rest of the day exploring the beautiful city of Kiev. In the city, there was very little destruction, which was a big contrast to what we had just experienced. It was just like being in any other big city. There were cafes, restaurants, malls, and lots of people. We felt conflicted, enjoying the beautiful city of Kiev, but at the same time, happy to see that Ukraine is so much more than just destruction. We also noticed how proud the Ukrainians were of their own country. There were wall paintings, posters, flags, and blue and yellow colors everywhere. On our last day in Kiev, we met with Tanya and Yuri Sokolovsky, who are part of YWAM Kiev. They showed us YWAM's house project called Homes of Hope, another project that makes temporary houses for destroyed villages so they can survive the winter. Uh, we will show you house one of 45 which we put in these two villages. Because the devastation here is about 60-70% of houses. And for people, it's not just house, it's just a small piece of hope for their life. And especially when in a village we have like 30 of them, it gave that feeling the life still coming back. And I hope in a two, three years that broken house will be a house. But that starts with this small hope. We also met their son, Mark. He had been in Norway doing his DTS and had now returned to Ukraine to serve in the army wanting to bring the love of God to the soldiers around him. People who came back from a front line, they have no light in their eyes, in their souls, in their minds. They just all around the darkness all the time. And this is, this is crazy. Praying is the best thing you can ever do. Just pray for Ukrainian soldiers that they will search for God in different ways. That will be big present for everyone. Mark is also volunteering in YWAM Kiev, helping out in different ministries whenever he gets some time off from the army. And some team came, they tell, we have been told that when we come to Ukraine, we not allowed to smile to people. Hmm. And I think, hmm? well, why, where it's come from? I know you have come to from. come with smile, we yeah. need it, we need yeah. light, we need, a life around. It doesn't mean that you are smiling from our hurts. No, it's life. We said our goodbyes and started driving back towards the west of Ukraine. But on the way, we saw something that we wanted to see a bit closer. It's a lot of fields around us. Some sunflower fields and just big fields. And it's a lot of light on it. So basically, if you run out of this field, you risk being uh, Okay, what are we doing, Sofia? We're gonna go film a blown up tank and we're uh, trying to navigate our way through the mines. <laughs> 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 Ladies first! <laughs> <laughs> you want 
see the minefields. Don't stumble. Is this step on the mine? No, it's oh, no. it's. Uh... <laughs> we were now on our way to the border to Poland, ready to go back home to Norway. Sophia, what are we doing now? We're go crossing the border. This is exciting. Bye, Fit. It was strange thinking about going back to our normal lives in Norway. Even crossing the border to Poland, we could feel a big change in the atmosphere. Suddenly the war felt so distant, and it almost made us feel guilty going back to a safe country, where we didn't have to worry about our homes and lives being taken away from us. Coming back home, we could look back on an impactful trip in Ukraine. A trip that led us to hear many stories, see the contrast of beauty and destruction, and that helped us to relate to people that has and still is suffering the consequences of the war. And as a response to the war, YWAM Norway started a fundraising campaign where we have been able to raise money towards already 200 houses being built, more food being distributed, and more people getting a new hope for their future. But only a week after we came back, we got the news about new attacks in Ukraine. Many of the areas we had visited had now been bombed once again. Even the city center of Kiev that we had enjoyed so much had more destruction and had again been a target. We were shaken by the news and realized that even though our trip was over, the war still wasn't over. Join us in continuing to help and pray for our brothers and sisters in Ukraine.